Okay, well, we might as well get started. So I think this is one of the only legal talks at the whole conference. Uh, so thank you for being masochists and showing up here to talk about legal subjects or at least listen about it. Um, by the way, feel free to break in with questions anytime you like. Don't, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, if you have a question about something, it's possible that likely that people sitting next to you do as well. So uh, thanks for coming to the stalwart few, what I think uh, might be interesting. Um, I'm Heather Meeker. I'm a lawyer in private practice. I work at a law firm called O'Melveny & Myers, which is a big international law firm. And my specialty is open source software licensing, which I've been working in for uh, longer than it's been cool. <laughs> so uh, quite a few years now. Uh, I wanted to talk today about how to do code releases uh, if you're operating in a private company. Um, a lot of engineers come to their companies and say, I really want to release this code or I want to contribute to this open source project. And uh, then uh, sometimes the internal lawyers at the company get confused and don't know what to do. This is your uh, guide to help them understand what you're doing and uh, what issues might come up and uh, to help you convince them that uh, what you're going to do is a good thing for the company. So I'll get started. Is there any distinction between, you said private, but yeah. any distinction between public? I only say pu private because I'm making the assumption that the organization you work for has uh, a, a, a mission to conserve its IP rights. If you work for an organization that has basically dedicated all of its IP rights to the public domain, then there's not going to be so much concern about it. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, basically there's a tension between a company's obligation to their owners to steward their assets and doing open source releases. So we're going to talk about how we tread the line between the two. Okay, so as you probably know, companies go through a life cycle and they start out and they're using open source code that's out there in the wild and they think it's really cool and they have a bunch of questions about how to comply with licenses and I'm not going to talk about that at all. I spend a lot of time talking about that day to day, but we're going to focus on what happens not when you take code into the company, but when you push it back out. Um, Companies then go through a sort of an adolescent period. You young people probably don't recognize uh, Annette Funicello. You know, <laughs> these, were, these were what teenagers looked like in the 50s. Um, and so in the adolescent period, you know, uh, companies start making usually contributions to existing open source projects. And then when you get down to be the wise old owl, um, you uh, are starting to become a leader in open source uh, development and making code releases, getting involved in foundations, and so forth. So when you go up the, uh, the ladder in terms of um, maturity of uh, participation in open source, these are the questions that are going to uh, be crossing your mind and your company's lawyers' minds. So why does your company care whether you push open source code out? Um, there are obviously some IP issues, but uh, there are some other issues as well that you might want to think about. First of all, um, all open source code often has even a very minimum of IP notices on it, copyright notices and so forth, but those are actually very important. And in open source development, they kind of serve as proxies for attribution and reputation. And so the first question you might want to ask is, am I advancing my company's reputation? Am I advancing my own personal interest or both? Uh, because that's going to be part of the discussion that you have with the company. Um, the company may or may not want recognition for your activities in open source. Some companies say, yeah, we want our name on that contribution. We want everybody to know we're participating. And some companies say, we do not want our name on that contribution. We do not want anyone to know we're participating. And uh, it, it, really, it really cuts both ways, and it depends on the preferences of your company. And uh, you know, usually when companies start to support their developers in open source contributions, it's because you're contributing to something that helps 
the business of the company. It may not be the main line of business of the company, but it's going to help the company establish its products as de facto standards or to put in place perhaps standards for computing that are going to make it easy for people to buy the company's products. The issue that the lawyers are going to be worried about is sometimes referred to intellectual property leakage. It's kind of a, a foul image, but, but it, it is a term that gets used pretty frequently. And what that means is the company wants to know what IP rights it's licensing. So if, for instance, someone at the company is releasing open source code without telling anyone at the company, that's obviously a situation where the company will not know that its own IP rights have been licensed. But then there's going to be uh, also a, um, an effect on the patent position of the company. So if I write some code, it's got a copyright in it, I release it under an open source license, everybody gets to practice the copyright and the code copy it, modify it, redistribute it, et cetera. There might be some conditions in the license, but basically the copyright's free for people to use. Um, you may know that a lot of open source licenses also have patent licenses wrapped into them, and uh, the company is going to be primarily concerned that it understands what patents it's licensing. So a threshold question is who owns the rights in the uh, software that you're writing? And I think a, a lot of developers have a general notion about how this works, but I'm going to talk to you about exactly how it works. So under copyright law in the United States, and in fact in most common law countries, the company owns a copyright in what you write within the course of employment. So if I'm employed as a developer, I write a piece of software, my company automatically owns the rights to that code. I'm a lawyer. If I wrote a program, uh, my company would not own the rights to that code because I'm, that's not in the course of my employment. It's not what I was hired to do. But if you're doing something in the course of employment, but then by operation of law with no, nothing else happening, it's actually the company that owns that copyright. Um, there, and that's under something called the Work Made for Hire Doctrine under copyright law. That's what it's called in the United States. Um, there are rules about things that you prepare on your own time, but the rules for that get fuzzier and fuzzier every year, every month, every second, because we're all nomadic workers, we're all working at home and at the company uh, premises, we're all working on company laptops at home, working on our own devices at the company and so forth and so on. So the way that people used to figure this out under the law is starting to blur very quickly and it's now kind of complicated. But the rule is basically if you write something uh, because it's your job to do that and particularly if someone at your company said, we want you to write this thing, that belongs to your company. If you write something on your own, but you use company resources to do it in a substantial way, that also belongs to your company. And even if you write something on your own that has to do with a projected business of the company, that's going to belong to the company. Who, who saw Silicon Valley? And so, yeah, so this was one of the issues. This was actually the issue that was uh, at play in that um, employee invention assignment agreement that was analyzed. Uh, all my friends and I, you know, on Facebook and everything, were like, "Did you think it was right?" You know, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, and so the the facts can be kind of complicated, but they have to do with were you acting as an employee when you wrote the code, and also were you using uh, company resources to write the code? Then patents, of course, to make it um, more complicated, works completely differently. Okay, so. If you invent an invention, that belongs to you. And only human beings can be the inventors of inventions. The only way your company get the, gets those rights is if you've signed an agreement with them and you have agreed to assign over your patent rights to the company. The fact is most of you who are you know, knowledge workers have signed such an agreement. And so your company's going to end up owning inventions that come out of the things that you create. So that's the baseline for who owns what. Um, so you guys all know this. I talk to lawyers a lot, so this slide is probably obvious to all of you, but uh, why, why do you set your code free? Well, in, 
most engineers really like to work on open source projects. They see the value in it possibly before their managers or their lawyers do. And so it's a, an important thing in order to retain the top talent that a company uh, be open source friendly and allow their engineers to, uh, to participate in open source development. Um, also, it can be a very good thing for business to influence infrastructure and so forth. So I'm not going to spend much time on this slide because you guys already know this, right? I don't have to make a case for you. OK, what happens when you start contributing to a third party open source project, one that's already out there in the wild? OK, so most companies who have addressed this issue have a process that they want employees to go through before making a contribution to an existing project. It usually goes something like this. And if your company has not done this and you want to contribute to an open source project, knowing how the most sophisticated companies go about this can help you establish a process at your company so that there's a path forward for you and you're not just getting roadblocks. So first, how does the contribution um, uh, further the interests of the company. I mentioned a few ways, but the basic thing is that most companies don't want to be releasing open source software that is their main line of business. There are a few exceptions to that, but not very many. Usually when you're releasing open source code and you're working at a private business, you're doing something that is enabling the company's products, but it isn't the company's product itself. Or there's a little piece of the company's product that's going to help you build a whole product and add value. And what you charge for and make money on is the value add and not really the open source part. Then you get to the meat of the thing, and you're going to have to convince your company that it's OK for you to do the contribution and still be respectful of the company's intellectual property rights. So first you ask, this copyright that I'm going to you know, give to a, a project, is it valuable for proprietary licensing? And the answer is about 99% of the time, no, it's not. Because if it were, you wouldn't be making that decision in the first place. What you're doing is you're saying, if we give this away, it'll actually get us more back. And then comes the one that's in orange there. And this is the main question that the lawyers are going to want to know. Are you actively seeking patent protection on anything that's embodied in that code that you wrote? Because once you contribute it to an open source project, it's not that the patent goes away. It's just going to get a lot harder to enforce for a variety of legal reasons. Uh, and so you're going to probably have to convince your company that it doesn't have any patents, and it's not seeking any patents that actually read on the code that you're contributing. And if you can convince them of that, you can make a good case that it's OK to do the contribution. And finally, is, does a contribution have any trade secrets in it? Well, obviously, once you make it publicly available, they're not trade secrets anymore. So uh, that's, that's usually such an easy question. It really doesn't have much time. Uh, uh, devoted to it. The main question is a patent question. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to like, understand the embodied by contribution uh, line of the middle part. Um, maybe you can give an example or something. But it seems like library code or, or most of the software that I can think of that would go up for contribution would be a subset of some overall important thing. And I, mean, I don't understand patents, but it seems like that would end up covering it. Yeah, so the way patents work is a patent, uh, when you write a patent, you write a claim. And the claim describes an invention. And for software, it's usually going to be what they call a method claim. So it's going to say a method of doing x. And x can be almost anything. So the question you're going to ask is, the actual code that I'm contributing, not the whole project that you're contributing to, but the stuff that I'm going to contribute, does that on its own actually practice this method? And the fact is that it's usually either too small a bit or too different from what your company is doing in its main line to be covered. Uh, the, the main thing is that I tell my clients is, it's OK to seek patent protection on stuff that you're contributing to open source. It's not wrong. It's just a waste of resources, because you should either be going down the open source path or you should be going down the patent path. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to do both at once. You're going to spend a lot of money on patent prosecution that's not going to net you much return. Uh, and and uh, and so it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah, some companies do. <laughs> Definitely protected from your patents. <laughs> Right, so, so I'll explain, I'll just like restate that a little in case it's helpful, which is, it's fine to seek patent protection on something you're contributing. You can't enforce it against people who are using under the open source license, or it's, it's very difficult to do. But you can still enforce it against someone else who might attack the open source project. So it can be used as a defensive mechanism. Um, it, most of my clients don't have a lot of money for patent prosecutions of their startups and so forth. So they're really balancing resources. So I'm usually saying, you know, spend your money elsewhere. But it does, it's not that it doesn't make sense at all. It can make the patents more difficult to enforce in some subtle ways, which I won't go into here. Uh, so um, what it means is you're willing to spend some money on patent prosecution that might never net you a return. But it's not irrational to do it. It's just um, not what most people do. Yeah? I'm not 100% sure on the patent laws, but is that we change to a first to file? Yes, yeah, so now the, the America Invents Act is, uh, on which I am not an expert, by the way, but most of it has to do with process. The thing that's sort of more interesting to developers is it's changed from a first to invent to a first inventor to file. So in the United States, we're very different from other countries on patents. Most other countries say the first person to file uh, is the owner of the invention. In the United States, we say the first inventor to file is the owner of the invention. It used to be just the first inventor, so even if someone else filed later, you could challenge that and say, I invented it first. Uh, so it, it's changed a little bit, but so far as kind of the 50,000 foot view has not changed a lot. Most of what that act did was uh, change some process so that it was a little easier to defend patent troll cases and also a little easier to challenge patents that you thought were, um, should be invalidated. Okay, if you're doing a contribution, the next thing you're gonna have to tell people from your company is what terms cover the contribution. So open source projects, you may already know, they run in one of two ways. They either run with a contribution license or without one. So most, um, most projects that are under licenses like GPL, which are copyleft licenses, don't use what they call a contribution agreement. Uh, most of them, um, like say the Linux kernel project, uh, they use something called a certificate of authenticity. I, is that what it's called? Yeah, developer certificate of originality, which is only saying I wrote this stuff, right? But it doesn't actually convey any rights. The rights are actually conveyed under the open source license. Whereas some projects have a two-step process where they have the license that covers the project which makes the, the rights available to the whole world and they have another license that brings the rights into the project. So there's an inbound license and an outbound license. So Apache uses that, and uh, uh, most uh, open source projects that are run by private corporations use it because they want the flexibility to change the outbound license if they want. So if you come to your company and say, I want to contribute this thing, one question you're going to need to be able to answer is, what, what license is governing the contribution? Because unless your company knows that, they can't make a rational decision about it. So you need to look at the project, find out are they using a contribution agreement, are, are they not, are they just using the outbound license so that you can help the lawyers figure that one out. Now, you know, when my clients come to me and ask me that question, I'll go figure it out, but sort of the average in-house company lawyer who has been sort of tasked at the last minute with open source stuff is going to need your help sorting this thing out. So it's, it's good if you can figure it out on your own. Um, I'm going to go through this. So if you uh, do a contribution, there are some things you should think about. 
Um, first of all, it's probably generally not a good idea to be contributing code that you didn't write to a project. There are some situations in which you can do that if you're sure you have the right to do it, but it's cleaner and easier for you to do a pull request with uh, just code that you wrote. And so you should look at the code first and say, okay, did I write this? This big block of stuff, could they just get that from someone else instead of having me try to convey the rights through me? Uh, so uh, if it's feasible to do, you should only be contributing stuff that you wrote. Um, you know, I was a coder once myself, so I know that coders have a tendency to put some information in, say, comments that is not strictly necessary for technical reasons. And so if you have any information like that, you, you got to make sure it's like ready for the world. So things like personal names, phone numbers, addresses, emails, uh, a name is fine if that's a holder of a copyright or you want to provide attribution, but you don't want to be, you know, outing people uh, uh, with, uh, by doing a code release. So uh, you should call the code for that. Um, eliminate inappropriate comments, which I often used to put in code when I was frustrated. Um, you should remove code that isn't actually used. Uh, a lot of code bases get you know, a lot of junk in them. And uh, a lot of times, actually, that junk, Jeff, you can, you can say whether I'm right or wrong, it causes licensing problems because there's this big code base and it's got all this stuff that's not actually built into the product. And then you start doing license review on it and all of the stuff that's not used doesn't have the right licenses. And then you spend all these cycles trying to figure it out and you figure it out, figure out at the end it's not even used in the project. Don't make that happen for the project that you're contributing to. And then you want to put a copyright notice, probably for your company, because it own, owns the rights, so that everybody know, knows who contributed the code. Yeah? Yeah, some projects, well, I think the better way to put it is they will not apply your copyright notice to their project. Um, whether they will remove your copyright notice is another question. So uh, I know that this is an issue that's come up for a lot of developers, and it's really a transparency issue for the project. So you should ask the project, what, what is your policy, although that's a little formal, like, what is your practice about doing this? Because sometimes they won't put your copyright notice into the project. That, whether they do or not, probably depends on how much you're contributing. If you're contributing a couple of lines, it probably won't put your copyright notice on it. And in any case, that's probably not enough to warrant copyright protection. Would your, would your copyright well, a copyright notice uh, today under current copyright law doesn't really mean a lot. So it applies in the sense that you own the copyright if there's a copyright to be owned in what you're contributing. And the copyright notice doesn't really change that. The copyright notice is intended to uh, provide uh, information to a user so they don't accidentally infringe something that because they think that it's not under copyright, which it's not even really all that relevant anymore. So today, they really serve as proxies for attribution. Yeah. I, I can't hear you, sorry. I might just put the word optionally in front of that to apply this. Oh, yeah. Um, well, OK, <laughs> optionally. Right. And they don't want to encumber the code with a whole ton of notices. I, I get that, and I think it's reasonable. But if you're contributing a lot, it's reasonable to have a notice on it. But you're right, as, as the repositories have gotten more sophisticated, you know, a lot of that is meta information now. It's not actually baked into the code. 
So, so if you're a lawyer and you're trying to figure out who owns something, it's actually a lot more useful to look at the meta information than the actual code anymore. Uh, and so that's really changed things, definitely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well the, I think there's not one, one answer, but I'll give you a few things to think about. First of all, not everything is subject to copyright protection. And there's this sort of meme floating around that if it's less than 10 lines, it's not subject to copyright protection, which is not a legal principle. It's, it's more like you know, a, a common sense notion. Uh, because in order to have copyright protection, something has to be expressive, and it has to it has to meet a an admittedly fairly low bar of creativity. So if you're making a bug fix and you're changing a zero to a one, that is not protectable by copyright. If you have a few lines, it's probably also not protectable by copyright. But the bar is really pretty low, so anything, you know, so there's this rule of thumb, 10 lines or more, you, you think about whether it's copyright protected or not. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the question of whether notices get retained, it's, it's also a social question, right? So, so you have, well, what I've heard is that a well-run project asks if it's going to take a notice off. It's a different thing to actually proactively apply it. And they often won't proactively apply them if you don't put them on. Jeff. I was just going to make a comment. Uh, I see that there's a, uh, at least one person out there who uh, has one line of code that contributed, I think, to YUI and jQuery, where originally it was claimed to be GPL and now been contributed to this project. But uh -huh. one line of JavaScript that they were claiming a GPL license to. So I've seen very small Th That would have to be one hell of a line of JavaScript. <laughs> I mean. I don't know JavaScript as well as I know some other things, so like I can see a line of Perl being a copyrightable work, but, but like JavaScript, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what you call a line, I guess. So uh, one line of code is unlikely to have any copyright protection, and if you find one line of GPL code in your project and you call me up and you say, Heather, I would like your legal opinion on whether I need to relight rewrite this line, I will say, no, you do not need to rewrite that line. Unless it's a, a whole Perl program on one line, then I might have a different opinion. OK. When you do a code release as opposed to contributing to an existing project, now you have to decide what license to apply. And I get a lot of people coming to me saying, what license should I put on the code? And um, I don't think that's. It's, it's an interesting question, but it's not a question that's going to get you to an answer. So here's how you get to the answer. There are a lot of open source license. We all know there are, well, there are over 60 that are approved. There are many more that are not approved by OSI. But you know there are about six that anybody really <laughs> uses. Okay, And so you can narrow down the choice pretty easily if you look at the motivations for what you're doing. Now, you know. I'm laying aside for the moment the notion that it's a moral imperative to release things under GPL. For most companies, that's not the case. For, for some people, that's the case. This discussion is not the discussion for them because they're going to just pick GPL. Uh, but you have to focus on your goals. And so I like to think about a couple of access, axes. Um, one is, do you want copyleft or permissive? And the other is, do you want a patent grant or not a patent grant? So you know, permissive, as you all know, is like mm, BSD, MIT, Apache. They say, here's a code. Do what you want with it. Put a notice on it. That's it. No, no more requirements. Copyleft is the free software paradigm where you have to make source code available, relicense on the same terms, and so forth. So those are two pretty different models. And what is going to serve your interests is going to be different. It's going to drive you towards one or the other. I would also comment that 
you can't go from permissive to copyleft. You can go from copyleft to permissive. So if you release some code under GPL and you decide, no, that's just not the right license for my community, they need more flexibility, then you can go to LGPL or one of the corporate copyleft licenses or a permissive license. But once you release under a permissive license, it makes no sense to go to a copyleft license because everyone can use it under the permissive license. So if you make a mistake, you err on the side of the copyleft model before the permissive model. And then you ask yourself, do I need an express patent grant? And the reason you may or may not want one is that if your company wants more clarity about what patent rights it's going to be granting, it's going to prefer the express grant. Now, you might hear some lawyers saying, oh, if there's no patent grant, there's no patent grant at all. And that's probably not really right. Um, it's actually a, a moderately complicated question, but I think the, uh, the conventional wisdom at this point is if you're trying to steward your patent rights and be careful about it, you want the express grant because you want to know what the contours are. So if you go with this little model, you can see that you're very quickly down to one or two choices. This makes it a lot easier. So if you don't want a patent grant and you want a uh, copyleft, you've got GPL or LGPL, and you're going to choose one of those based on what you're writing. If you're writing a whole program, you choose GPL. If you write a part of a program, you choose LGPL. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you want a patent grant and you want it to be permissive, there's really only one license and it's Apache 2. So this quickly drives you towards one or two choices and makes it, it, it makes hundreds into two. So that's a lot easier. Um, BSD and MIT, from sort of my point of view, there's no difference between the two. Legally, they do exactly the same thing. And so people choose one or the other. Maybe if you're contributing to something that gets used with a lot of other code that's under one license, you would choose that one, perhaps just for consistency's sake. But it is not necessary to do that. And then the copyleft choices are a little bit more complicated, but um, it really just depends on what you're trying to, to do with your code. Um, unless you're trying to make a business like uh, Oracle, um, you know, getting people to get licenses to your code that is otherwise under GPL, you should not be choosing GPL for pieces of programs because what you're doing then is you're creating what I would call a license bug. You're putting code out in the wild that you can't use under the license if you want to use it in a proprietary product. Uh, of course, if you, you want to try to force people to use GPL, then you release stuff under GPL. But that is, uh, that is kind of a, an uber decision. Um, and that's not what most companies want to do. What most companies want to do is choose a license that gets the code used uh, as much as possible. OK, so we went through these questions. Um, here's a little checklist for uh, releases as opposed to uh, all the stuff about uh, contributions still, still applies. But here are some extra things to think about. When you choose a name for your release, you do not want to use your company name or anything like it because that will cause you trademark management issues. Uh, trademark and open source, the intersection of the two is very Weird and interesting area. Weird and interesting is good for lawyers and probably not for anyone else. But, uh, but you don't want to call, you know, if, if your company is called XYZ, you do not want to release open source code called Open XYZ unless you have a very careful brand management um, strategy for that because that could make it difficult for you to enforce your trademark in XYZ. Um, Make sure before you do a code release, unless you just want to orphan it on GitHub, which, by the way, some of my clients want to do for some reasons, um, make sure you actually have people and resources to steward the project so that it will really become a living project and have people participating in it. Got to set up a repository. T today, that's uh, you know, as easy as falling off a log. It used to be a little harder. You want to apply the license. And for the sake of the rest of the world, please, apply a license and apply it in a clear way. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, particularly on GitHub, there's no license terms at all. What that means is you can't use the code at all. Unfortunately, it's probably the opposite of what people think it means. Uh, but be clear about where the license is. 
put it in a text in a license.txt or copy.txt or readme.txt, something like that, in your repository so everybody knows what the license is. And it's also good to say on the page, if you have a custom page, this is licensed under GPL2, this is licensed under Apache 2, whatever, so that people don't have to spend a lot of cycles figuring out how to comply with your license. You know, they probably do want to comply, but if you hide it, it will be harder for them to do that. And uh, finally, you, you want to make sure that if you're releasing code that has ex potential export issues, that you've done a review for that. The export laws actually have a, uh, Jeff was talking about this in his talk yesterday, um, Software is actually regulated for export in the United States. That means if you're going to make code available to people outside the US, which basically happens when you put it on a server, right? Um, there are actually regulations associated with that. Uh, fortunately, there are some exceptions for open source code that usually make it not a problem, but it's worth thinking for a moment about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm the exporter, and I need to worry about export control. So as long as I open source on GitHub, I don't have to worry about that loss of I, I don't think that's a good approach. I, uh, <laughs> um, I am not an export expert, but I would guess that, that's, that you're not insulated from liability. I mean, I do know enough to know that when you're responsible for an export violation, that can include uh, encouraging other people to export in violation of the law. So I think if you put it on GitHub, then it would just be like vicarious responsibility instead of direct. And I don't know if there's any real difference between those two things. Um, I, I have rarely had clients who have actually had problems with export issues with open source code that is released open source. They have problems using open source code in binary products and then releasing it because there can be export restrictions that uh, that relate to that. But actually releasing source code is usually easy to do. Uh, nevertheless, when you're releasing a project, you may want to be kind to the people who are possibly using your project and say, hey, this might have export issues if you put it in a binary project, right? Uh, so you, you might want to be sensitive to the issue, but it usually didn't end up be, doesn't end up being a problem. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's entirely cryptography. I don't know of any other class, uh, classifications that, uh, that are problematic, um, but, but I'm not entirely sure there's nothing else. Uh, cryptography is what every single question I've ever gotten in my whole career about export has been about. Is there some compelling reason for that that I'm unaware of, or is it just not a big law? I mean, cryptography? Uh, why is it an export issue? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure how to answer that except in a historical context, and that is that cryptography has generally, first of all, it's regulated as a munition. Uh, so export law in the United States has Department of Commerce restrictions and Department of Defense restrictions, and this is a Department of Defense restriction. So it's actually considered a weapon. Um, it, the idea is that having strong cryptography available to those that we're at war with is a problem. And that may seem bizarre, except when you, you know, look at the history of even back as far as World War II, where cryptography was essential in, you know, winning the war and, or breaking other people's cryptography was essential in it. So I think it's mostly a historical thing, but um, that's about all I can say. I don't know if anyone else has any... Uh, smarter uh, ideas. My feedback is that we, as open source contributor a lot, this is the only thing that we feels like we waste a lot of cycles on for your legal stuff. So it really does burn a lot of our time. It, if, it, if, you're, if you're going to release the code open source, there's actually an exception that usually makes it not, not a problem. Binary, right? Actually, it's like yeah, a not in a binary. Came recently, and, you know, one of the big impetus is to use things like that in open source projects and not have to release binary blobs for VMs at all, right? Yeah. 
it it is definitely an irritating issue. Um, uh, that's about all I can say about I'm, I'm it. I'm a lawyer now. I can rant professionally, but other people on a lawyer says that there's no problem with that. <laughs> uh, th there is an exception for open source. Uh, basically, I think it's called, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's not called open source. It's, called, it's like software where the source is available, and so it ends up applying to all open source. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, you know, my uh, plug, but this is my book. And I was going to give the copy to the best question, but I have to give it to the person who provided us with the, uh, the connector so that we could do the talk. So this will, will be for you. Um, this is a, a guide, practical guide to open source in business. It discusses a lot of legal concepts, but it's not just for lawyers. It's intended to be uh, useful to uh, non-lawyers. And then for the lawyers, um, there's actually a computer tutorial in the beginning that explains a lot of the concepts that the lawyers have to know. So if you're talking to the lawyers in your company and they're like, what the hell is a link? Then you can just point them to here and it will explain to them uh, so that they won't think you're talking about hyperlinks. Um, and. Uh, and that's it. Uh, any, uh, any further questions before we adjourn? Yeah. At what point do you actually uh, start to review the code for patent infringements? Um, you know, obviously there's a number of different contributions going uh, and, and new designs being created. What, what point should you consider uh, any type of patent infringement? The, the conventional wisdom is that you never review code for patent infringement. And, and, this is sort of weird, but the, the patent law says that if you are a willful infringer, uh, you can get up to three times, the, the, the plaintiff can get up to three times the damages. And so most lawyers in private practice will say, you don't go out and proactively review anything to see if it infringes a patent. But if someone comes to you and says, this infringes a patent, then uh, you, you do a review and you usually get a lawyer to write an opinion that it doesn't infringe. Um, so going out and doing proactive review actually can cause a lot of issues, not only potential liability, but it's a little complex, but when you get into things like corporate transactions, nobody knows what to do about anyone who went out and said, hey, our stuff infringes a patent. It, it, it just causes all sorts of problems. I would say there's one exception, and that is that if you know that you're releasing software and it requires the practice of an existing standard that has a patent associated with it, I would be transparent about that. So if your project requires MPEG, you know, don't hide the ball about that because that's not going to, it, it can't hurt you to say this requires MPEG and everybody knows that's got a patent portfolio associated with it, or if you have to use Qualcomm's patent portfolio or Microsoft's patent portfolio, um, that's, I view that as sort of a service to your users to make sure that they're not um, inadvertently getting themselves into trouble. But you never go out and say, hey, does this infringe a patent? Um, doing, th that's sometimes called a freedom to operate assessment, and, um, and it's usually not done. No, um, the only way you can be uh, liable for patent infringement is if you're actually selling a product that infringes or if you induce someone else to infringe and merely providing code is not going to be enough for inducement. Um, all open source licenses have complete warranty disclaimers in them and for this at least it works. Uh, you would not be, you, you might induce if you go to the person and you say, I would really like you to sell this product that has this patented invention in it. Uh, but, uh, but that's different from just contributing some code. Thanks, everybody, so much. And uh, I'll be around if you have questions.